Denver police sideline nine officers for all firing on a shooting suspect. Let's look at the rules for using deadly force. Can one officer fire just because another did? Rebuilding homes after last year's mega fires, Colorado has decided against statewide rules on where you can build. Red Rocks is headed for a full house as our state's key COVID numbers all move in the right direction. A party leader at the state capitol asks for a redo after hitting yes when he really, really meant to vote no. And Colorado kids have submitted their names for our state's plow fleet. The Sandalorian is awesome, but there is no way that CDOT's ever going to name a plow abolish ice. Saltier than our road clearing strategy, this is next. Denver police are short nine officers on the street today. When an officer fires their weapon, they're put on administrative leave and taken off the street while the investigation proceeds. And it was nine DPD officers that all fired their weapons at the end of that chase on Friday. They shot and killed a man who they said had shot at them during the chase. Our Marshal Zellinger looks at what led up to that moment. Denver police did not provide a count for how many bullets were fired at the end of this chase on Friday, saying the nine officers involved in firing their weapons are still being interviewed. All nine are now on administrative leave, which means they're still working, just not out patrolling the streets. The commander of Denver's Major Crimes Division said all officers were wearing uniforms, had their body cameras on, and tried for one minute to gain compliance of the man at the corner of First and Perry before he raised a handgun, pointed it at several officers, and fired two rounds. Nine officers shot back. To be deemed justified, they each have to show they felt in danger for their life or someone else's. Correct. They each have to independently establish either a first or third party self or defense case um, to why they discharged their weapon. Simply firing because another officer fired their weapon it would not be sufficient. Police said the man who was killed in the shooting, 22-year-old Cedric Vick, was being chased after he carjacked a woman at gunpoint, a woman who they say struggled to get her toddler out of the car before it was stolen. Police say Vick fired his gun at that woman and at police during the chase. Following the shooting death of Jessica Hernandez in 2015, DPD changed its policy to not allow officers to shoot at a moving vehicle, although the policy allows officers to do so if the driver is shooting at them. But Friday's shooting happened after Vic crashed his vehicle. All the officers were outside of their vehicles. The vehicles were all stationary, including the offender's vehicle, um, when the shots were fired by the officers. So that change in policy uh, would not have applied to this situation. The Denver police commander said that nine is a larger number than DPD typically sees in a shooting. Sometimes you've got multiple officers from multiple departments at the same scene. One thing, Kyle, that stood out to me at this news conference was how specific DPD was. Officers were in uniform saying, show us your hands. Everyone had their body camera activated. Even though we didn't see any body camera today, a transparent start. Well, if nothing else, Marshall, they know the questions that will be coming in short order. Thank you very much. Almost 50% of Coloradans are fully or partially vaccinated at this point. 48% of us, if you now lump those two groups together. Also, wonderful news on COVID hospitalizations. Down 33 patients in a day. It's now at 530 patients. That is a steady downward trend, 123 fewer Coloradans in the hospital with COVID than this time last week. Our seven-day positivity average has finally dipped back below 5% for the first time since March. That, as well, is encouraging news and suggests that the spread of the virus is slowing. So no show at Red Rocks tonight. If there was a show there, another 3,800 people could soak in the rain and the music simultaneously. Red Rocks is upping its capacity limit to 6,300 people starting today. Good news for fans of Mount Joy, which will be the first concert with expanded capacity on Saturday. Red Rocks goes full capacity, about 9,500 people starting June 21st. The sound of saws echoes across Grand County as people are rebuilding the homes lost in the East Troublesome Fire last year. They can rebuild where and how they want, despite the risk of another wildfire. Years back, a group of experts recommended that Colorado consider a wildfire building code. Local control won out. Our Steve Steger goes up to Grand County to show us what that looks like. The view was the absolute selling point. We were here for about 17 years. The windows of Shelly Olson's home 
once provided a panorama of everything that makes Colorado great. To lose everything, you can't imagine it till you go through it. The East Troublesome Fire took the windows, the house, and some of the scenery. The trees are just kind of frozen, blown. She knew this was possible. Being in the fire service, you shouldn't think that it's not gonna happen to you, but I guess I kinda had that feeling that it wouldn't happen to me, but. But this assistant fire chief says nothing truly prepares you for this kind of loss. I basically just collapsed in the driveway, bawled my eyes out, in denial, I think, still, because it was, couldn't even believe it. Um, it was hard to swallow. Um, Olson and her husband built their home in Grand Lake in 2004. The type of material, the heavy timber, it's very difficult to get that to ignite. They did it in a county that has no specific rules for how to build in this space, where the forest meets the neighborhood, what firefighters call the wildland urban interface, or WUI. I think that, you know, Grand County is, you know, it's one of those counties that people come here to do what they want to do on their property. In Colorado, it's a local decision whether or not to tell people how to build in places like this. At a minimum, we don't even have resources at the state level that would say, if you are a community interested in adopting a local building code, this is the way you could do it. Molly Maori is a land use planner who runs a nonprofit helping communities in the WUI build smarter. After devastating fires in 2012 and 2013, a task force recommended the state consider adopting a statewide building code for areas like this, either as a mandate or simply a model that local governments could adopt. Proposals for both died in the state legislature. I believe there was a lot of resistance to, you know, fears about the costs, fears about local control, home rule. We know we're going to see growth. Why don't we equip these communities to do it in a way that isn't then isn't setting them up for some type of failure in the future? County governments still make these decisions on their own. The building codes actually start out on the highway. Across the divide from Grand County, Boulder does it differently. Driveways have got to be a certain a certain size. First level of brick is really good too. Underground cisterns for storage of fire water buried propane tanks. Those are the kind of things that caught me by surprise. When Dave Kielsmeyer decided to build on these 35 acres near Nederland, his friends warned him. Uh, we heard a lot about, oh man, you're in Boulder County, that's gonna be tough. Boulder County has had strict wildfire building codes on the books since 1993. I think we've only had like one or two houses that have, have gone through the, the new building code process um, that had the, those wildfire mitigation requirements that, that were actually uh, destroyed in a wildfire. Kyle McCaddy works for the county, helping homeowners understand the rules. There is some some kind of back and forth, but but you know, mo once you explain it, most people understand it. It's not cheap. Oh yeah. Dave estimates yeah. it added about 15 to 20 percent to the cost of the project. It's worth it for the privilege to be up here, and for the peace of mind, you know, knowing that, you, that at least you've done everything that you're that you can do. This was heavy timber, right? Back in Grand County, <laughs> the engine block. Olson admits from uh, Toyota, even the most restrictive building codes might not have saved her property from the powerful East Troublesome fire. Not every fire is going to be an East Troublesome. So we need to plan for the 90%, you know, the 99%, the fire that we can protect our homes against. She's leading a group now looking at what regulations, if any, could work here. It'll be a tough sell. I mean, my goal is to not lose another home you know, here or another life. New perspective from an assistant fire chief who's been there. But I will never do my job the same again, dealing with folks who have been evacuated or lose their homes. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Glad we took a bit more time to explore that. The chair of the Grand County Board of Commissioners told Steve that they'll take whatever suggestions Shelley's group comes up with and try to balance them with the desire for individual property rights. They did note they're considering being more proactive in going in to tell people that they need to do mitigation work, clearing the trees and the brush away from homes. Want to quickly thank you for your work fighting hunger 
statewide through your Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns the last couple of weeks. Food insecurity is a persistent issue in our state. It's why we're addressing it through a, a few different fronts in collaboration with Nine Cares Colorado Shares this month. Last week, you all raised more than $25,000 for the mobile pantries from Food Bank of the Rockies. They go out and bring a fully stocked food bank in a refrigerated truck to areas that don't have great access to grocery stores. I mean, complete with fresh produce right there on the refrigerated truck. And your $25,000 raised is going to go a long way to help them go more places more often. I'll be back on Wednesday with one last idea in our series of campaigns focusing on fighting hunger. It's a way for young people to help solve some of their parents' worry about where the family's next meal is going to come from. When I reached up and pressed what I thought was the no button, but it was the yes button. Oh, no. Or, or oh, yes. A leader at the state capitol hits the wrong voting button on a key piece of legislation. Would they give him a do-over? And there has been much talk today about the future of Roe versus Wade and abortion. Let's look at what a ruling against abortion by the Supreme Court would mean in Colorado, short-term and long-term. Next. Abortion opponents are celebrating the Supreme Court's decision out today that they're going to hear a major case out of Mississippi. If the conservative majority on the court rolls back the rights afforded in the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, abortion access in Colorado would not change right away, as it would in some other states that have anti-abortion laws on the books. Here in Colorado, it would take action by the legislature or a vote of the people. It would be similar to if, for example, the Supreme Court all of a sudden decided that, you know, it was no longer unconstitutional to racially discriminate. The only thing then stopping Colorado from having segregated buses would be the Colorado legislature or the will of the people given the referendum process. See law professor Aya Gruber, who you heard from there, says uh, sort of worst case scenario for advocates of reproductive rights would be a number of Supreme Court decisions after this coming decision next year. If there were further rulings that would restrict abortion or force the states to regulate it. The top ranking Republican in the state house voted for a bill to keep somebody convicted of a violent crime from getting a new gun. And then he quickly said... His yes vote was a mistake. House Minority Leader Hugh McKean was a surprise vote in favor of a bill to strengthen gun background checks and to keep people from passing a background check within five years of a violent misdemeanor. Leader McKean said that it was an oopsie. He asked for a revote. I happened to have my computer open a moment ago and I reached up and pressed what I thought was the no button, but it was the yes button. 1298 was a bill that I was opposed to, and it was, I was opposed to it on a lot of different reasons. And I got up here and spoke against it. Members, I'm going to encourage a no vote. I understand and appreciate your situation. And we'll take this moment to remind us all that on third readings, we really should have our computers closed and our phones down and paying attention. Ooh, it's cold. McKean asked for that revote. The Democrats who have control of the House did not give him the two thirds vote he would have needed to get his do over. The Avs blackout has been longer than the regrettable one you had in college. But we'll get you caught up in the Stanley Cup playoffs. You'll be talking hockey like you didn't miss a thing. And we sort through the hundreds of suggested names for Colorado's snowplow fleet. All of them came from kids. If you think you've got a better name for a plow, get that name ready next. Rainy days and Mondays becoming a theme around here, and the rain could turn heavy tonight as the center of circulation over the Four Corners area brings more moisture up into the front range and up over the higher terrain that rain changes over to snow. One more gray, cold day with a chance for showers and storms again tomorrow. Some of the rain will be quite heavy out on the eastern plains, and that's an area of prime concern as we've already seen at least two to three inches of water on the ground there, and street flooding is a potential in Denver as well. Mostly cloudy with rain and thunder early the near 
areas of fog are low at 50. Tomorrow, a few thunder showers, a cool day, high at 64. Back to sunshine and 70s for the rest of the week. The warmest day looks to be Thursday with a high near 80. The choices we make today will echo for eternity, or at least as long as Colorado's current snowplow fleet is still on the roads, because the state is renaming the plows. We told you this. They're letting the school kids pick the names. There are cities and states and, and countries around the world that have done this previously. It's very, very popular. It's Colorado's turn, and the children did not disappoint. From the list of kids' submissions, we went through hundreds of them. There's Blizzard of Oz, Angelina Snow Lee, Baby Snowda, which came from a preschooler in Golden. Barack Snowbama, third grader in Aurora. That's me and the producer Kevin's favorite one. Uh, Duchess of Slurry, that's also a really good one, came from Arvada. Don't Be So Pushy, from a third grader in Peyton. I Snow the Way Out. No Way Snow Day, from a fifth grader in Colorado Springs. Plow or Never, and I'm Not a Panda, from a fourth grader in Superior, partial to all caps. Uh, two kids also suggested the plow name Abolish Ice. That was actually the second most popular suggestion when Minnesota tried to rename its plows. Reports there say the state government threw out the name Abolish Ice because it was too political. If you believe you're smarter than a fifth grader and you have a better snowplow name for us, we can take it. Can't put it on a plow. That's CDOT's job. Uh, and they're only taking names from kids. But if one of you grown-ups comes up with a name that's better than the ones the kids have, I will share it here on the program. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. So all us casual Avs fans, hockey fans, we have caught a break. The best blacked-out team in America is going to play its first-round playoff games on television that most of us will be able to watch, despite the two-year fight between the Avs owner, Kroenke Sports, and Comcast and Dish. Our Steve Staker is one of those diehards who made sure that he could still watch the Avs during the blackout. And Steve has offered to get creative to catch the rest of us up. It's been a weird year, and you can almost completely blame COVID for it. The season didn't start until January, and it was only 56 games long instead of the usual 82. The Avs only played eight of the 31 teams in the league during the regular season, sometimes playing the same team over and over, like a baseball series. They had to pause their season twice because of COVID, and the team looked a tad different this year, adding rock star Devon Taves on defense and watching their recent draft picks shine in Bowen Byram and Alex Newhook. At the beginning of the year, Nathan McKinnon said, I guess we're the favorites or whatever. And that turned out to be true. They won the President's Trophy for the best team in the regular season. It's the first time they won it since 2001, a year they also won the Stanley Cup. Now they've got home ice advantage in the playoffs and they'll be on TV. So no more stick figures. Apparently we had some rights issues there. Our thanks to Steve Steger for that. One of your questions about whether this show is sticking around. Next. All right, I've been reading through all your plow names. Uh, there are a couple of uh, there are a couple that are pretty good. Uh, Epifanio uh, says the Polis Express. That's actually pretty decent. Although I think if I had to pick one of yours, it would be Marjo who wrote in to say Snow White versus the Seven Drifts. It's good. It's long, but it's good. Unsigned email who asked when the home studio show, this show ends in May, will you and the show remain just in an office setting? Nothing is forever, but yes, God and management willing, we will remain and we'll see you next time.